Detroit. I'm the director of Detroit Disability Power. I am a white woman with my blonde hair pulled back, wearing a red shirt and sitting on a back porch. Uh, and we're gonna quickly go over some accommodation and tech review on a slide that will come up on the screen now. So we are really interested in creating access together and we're very much open to your feedback about this practice. Uh, you can email info at DetroitDisabilityPower.org for any feedback on our access tonight or in the way that we present the access. We're always trying to make it better. Um, we invite you throughout this event to message us with access or other questions. That's what I mentioned a minute ago about Eva Tech DJ or uh, Rami, the chat moderator. We ask that you please stay on mute when not speaking. Uh, so that we don't have as much background noise. Uh, we also ask you to please wait till one person is done talking, so uh, before you begin speaking, and then to state your name each time you speak. Um, also, we're going to ask you to please use the chat minimally uh, unless we ask you to answer a question, and that is for the sake of those of us using screen readers. Um, and we will break if access stops, so if something goes awry, let's just push pause, figure it out, and then move forward so no one gets left behind. Uh, if you wanna use captions tonight, there are auto captions. Uh, you can click the CC live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen towards the right. And uh, if you are someone using ASL, we do have two interpreters tonight. We ask you to please change your Zoom name to put a one in front of your name. That will allow us to easily sort people in breakout rooms later today. So. If you're using ASL, please uh, click the three dots at the top of your Zoom tile, scroll down to rename, and put a one in front of your name. And then finally, um, if you want to keep your camera on, we'd love to see your face. Um, if you can do that, it's much appreciated. If that um, is not something that works for you, though, it's okay and we understand. So uh, this is us creating access together. Please be proactive uh, and, and let's take collective responsibility for making sure this works for everyone. Thank you. Um, I see a, chest, a question in the chat that says, what does it mean to message? Uh, so if you do have an access challenge, um, you can message in the chat to the full group or directly to Eva the tech DJ or Rami the chat moderator that they can help you get the problem resolved. Thank you. All right, so uh, what are we doing this evening? That is what's next. Um, we're gonna finish up this access and introduction. Uh, then we're gonna have our friend Chantal from Healing by Choice lead us in a quick grounding and land acknowledgement. I'm gonna queue up some context and goals about how we got here this evening, introduce you to our fantastic panelists who I'm so excited for you to meet. Um, we're going to have a quick break, five minute break. We're going to come back and have a moderated conversation with our panelists. We're going to go into breakouts uh, for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to come back, have a conversation and end with a live musical performance. So um, get ready. It's going to be an awesome two hours. Glad you're here. Thank you so much. So um, while I'm kind of, oh, okay, here, uh, <laughs> thank you for the slide. Uh, tonight, we uh, wanna create a, um, an environment together where people feel like they can be uh, seen for who they are and engage meaningfully. And uh, to that end, we have these proposed community agreements. So as you all just went through the access check, uh, that's super important to us. We invite all of you here to listen carefully and deeply. Um, there's gonna be a lot of wisdom dropped. Some of it's gonna be obvious, some of it might be subtle and come back later to, to, to your mind uh, in a cool way. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff that's gonna be shared. So <clears throat> we're uh, excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, we also invite people to share from their personal experience. Um, your life and your experiences really matter. Uh, and connect to the big picture, which is one of the things we're gonna be talking about this evening. Uh, we also invite you to practice both and thinking. Uh, you know, there are multiple ways that reality exists for people and our experiences are not all the same. 
but um, sometimes they are, right? And so we can come in with an open mind and understand different types of people, even if we actually can't imagine their uh, situation or scenario, uh, we can make space so that we can all be here. Uh, we also wanna let you know to expect and accept discomfort and unfinished business. Uh, we have a lot of ableism. We got a lot of other problems. We're not gonna solve all of them tonight. Uh, some of our conversations might be difficult, but this is all about moving us along through a process of better understanding ourselves in the world and making the world a better place. And then also, even though there are some heavy topics this evening, you can also expect joy. There's probably gonna be some jokes. Uh, there'll definitely be some fun stuff shared and um, we can have fun together, even though we're digging into some really deep and important stuff. Uh, so I want to uh, also thank the University of Michigan Medicine um, Ideal RRTC Community Grants Program for funding this uh, series that we are in the fourth of five events. Um, their support has made it possible for us to do this series, um, and we're really grateful to their support, both in terms of funding and in terms of other types of support and friendship. So thank you all very much. Uh, for anybody in the uh, audience who wants to learn more about this, the timing is great because applications for the 2022 community grant uh, are now available on their website. We're going to drop that link in the chat so you all can check out that opportunity and see if it makes something for you to apply for and you can do a cool thing like a community conversation series. So uh, next up, I wanna pass it over to my pal Chantel from Healing by Choice. Welcome Chantel, thank you so much for being here with us. Hello, Mike, Coco, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. I'm Chantel and I'm here on behalf of Healing by Choice. And we, I would like to begin by honoring the ancestral land on which we live on and work on. And this is the indigenous land of the Ishinabe Aki. They are the people of the three fires consisting of the Ottawa, Adawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe. And they are still here tending to the land in, in right relationships. Detroit is also the largest majority black city in the nation with a long legacy of African diasporic global contributions, which once on the last stop of the Underground Railroad, it's known by its code name, Midnight. Detroit is also the largest US city with a concentration of Arab Americans, a border city within a historic growing Latinx community. And um, it is also um, with a large contribution of uh, Asian Americans as well. I would like to um, mention Healing by Choice and lift them up as well as just a bunch of us um, that really believe and committed into being in the right relationship and making healing accessible to everyone in Detroit. So I'd like to just do a practice, a grounding practice before we start with this evening's agenda. So get comfortable wherever you're at. However that is for you as best as possible, wherever you may be standing or sitting or laying. So wherever you are, just notice what is holding you. And take a moment to soften yourself into this moment. Some of us do that by going to our breath. Some of us do that by counting to 10, whatever you need to do to spring yourself into this moment. So if you could just go to your breath and just notice the quality of it as you breathe in and breathe out. Notice the sensation, the biggest sensation that you're experiencing in your body right now. Is it at the tip of your nose? Is it in the back of your throat, your chest, your belly? Just notice when sensations are coming up for you at this moment as you simply Notice your breath. I 
I love doing this breath. It's called 478. It's very simple and you can draw from this at any time. We're gonna take in a breath for four seconds. We're gonna hold for seven and then we're gonna exhale for eight. So I'll go ahead and count us off the first two times and then we can do about a round or two by ourselves. So let's begin taking in a deep breath. Two, three, four, holding. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, that's it. And exhale. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go ahead and just take a couple of breaths naturally. And we're going to count off one more time. Inhale for four, ready, and one, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Oops. Oh, and release for eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then go back. To the breath as normal. As you go back to the breath, just notice if that sensation changed from the first time you checked in. Notice where that sensation is bigger. Is it still at the tip of your nose? Back of your throat? Or are you noticing the sensation in your belly? This is a beautiful breath to come to. It relaxes the body system, the somatic, it's a somatic practice. It takes you from your thoughts into your body, which is a beautiful practice to go to anytime we're feeling overwhelmed at any time in this session this evening or any time in our lives. We can draw from this. So let's go ahead and do that one round on our own. Whenever you're ready, taking in the breath for four seconds. Holding that for seven. And then releasing for eight. Thank you. I would like to do a quick body scan. We do that by paying attention to the hairline. Right at the tip of our forehead. We're going to work our way down to our temples, noticing if there's any tension in that area, any holding. You can use your breath to soften these spaces. between your eyebrows. Your cheeks, your jaw. The jaw and the belly go together. When we're tightening in our jaws, our bellies are also feeling that tension. So if we can just even just notice that or notice when we're clenching and help, let us use our breath as a softening of our jaw, our belly too will also let go of that tension as well. Noticing the jaw, the chin, the throat, our chest. Our bellies. And when you get here, just notice for a moment the rise and fall of our bellies. Are we breathing deeply, just enough to fill it? 
to massage our organs just with our breath. And you can use this technique to just move through any part and check in with any part. And also to release the tension in any area that may feel that we may need some loosening from built up tension unknowingly or even knowingly. This breath is a powerful tool. It is always available for us and accessible to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for practicing this breath with me this evening. And on behalf of Healing by Choice, we bid you a farewell. Mahalo Thank you so much. Lisa. Thank you, Chantal. This is Dessa. Really appreciate you getting us in the right um, head and body space to have this important conversation. Um, we're going to put some information in the chat about Healing by Choice uh, so that you all can check them out and all the wonderful things that they do. So like I said, uh, my name is Dessa, for those of you just joining, and I am the Executive Director of Detroit Disability Power. Uh, we have a mission of building the political and organizing power of the disability community. And we believe that true inclusion is revolutionary, which means that when we design a world and a culture to truly accommodate the diversity of people that live here, we have literally changed everything. And that is a very exciting prospect to us. Uh, as many of you, over the last nearly year and a half, we have lived and organized through a global pandemic. And the systems of oppression that we already knew targeted our communities became even more evident as people of color, people with disabilities and elders were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. We have had to fight for even the most basic access to COVID testing, medical care and vaccines for the disability community. More recently, we've organized to protect students with disabilities and their families by pressuring districts to require masks, social distancing and vaccines or regular testing. If safety precautions are not designed with the most at risk or disproportionately impacted populations in mind, we fear that a segregated education system will emerge. One for those who can risk going to school and one for those who have to stay home for the sake of their health and safety. You can imagine which would provide a better, better education and which would be where the chronically ill and disabled students are stuck. So one of the core tenets of organizing is that the people most impacted by a problem are the ones who lead the development of the solution. COVID has touched every generation in unique and challenging ways. Each generation has had a, a, a something to contend with when it comes to COVID, and that has often been different based on age. So when thinking about solutions, we thought we'd focus some attention on the wisdom of intergenerational organizing, learning across the lifespan from each other. And I don't know what could be more powerful than that. So that's the context of this evening. That's where the idea for this series came from, focusing on the intersection of racism, age, ageism, and ableism. Um, and like I mentioned briefly earlier, this is a five-part series. Tonight is number four of the five. So there's one more left coming up on November 18th. Uh, we'll put a link to the chat if you want to RSVP for that. It's been a really um, awesome series to put together. We've had some really incredible conversations um, through our panelists and through our small breakout groups with all of you who have been joining us. So uh, if this is your first time or this is your fourth time, we're super glad you're here. Um, also, if you missed some community conversations, they're all up on our YouTube channel. So if you go to the Detroit Disability Power website, you can click on the YouTube link uh, and find all of our videos there. So for more info uh, and to RSVP for future conversations, uh, we're gonna put that in the chat. 
So over the course of this evening, we hope you learn some new things, deepen your intersectional analysis, reflect on your own life and work, and leave inspired and motivated to create a world where we can all be our full selves. I'm honored to be here with all of you and the panelists this evening. And before we dig into a conversation with them, uh, I wanna ask you all two quick poll questions. So um, two polls are gonna pop up. I will read them aloud uh, and then we'll look at the results. So the first question is, I have wondered if my age has impacted the care I receive at the doctor's office or influenced how people treated me. So this is about your perception of how you're treated because of your age. Uh, the second question is, are you part of any group with regular engagement that includes both people under 25 years old and people over 70 years old? For an example, a dance group, a religious community, a work setting, et cetera. So this is about, do you have a group where there are people at both ends of the lifespan uh, in the same group? So an intergenerational group. So about a little more than half of you have answered the questions. Uh, once we get the rest of y'all, we'll end the poll and see, see how this shakes out. Okay, last call for answering the poll question. We have just a couple people left. Okay, let's see. All right, so the first question, which is if people had wondered whether their age had, age had impacted how they were treated, about 77% said yes. They, they have wondered if age was a factor in how they were treated. Uh, and I, I just want to point out, this could be people who feel like being young has impacted the way they were treated um, or being older impacted the way they were treated or really anywhere in between, right? It's not just one or the other. Uh, and then the second question about being part of an intergenerational group, about half of you said yes, and about 35% said no, and the rest were not totally sure. So about half yes, that's the main takeaway there. All right, well, thank you all so much for participating in that. Okay, so uh, now I get to introduce you all to our panelists. Um, I'm very excited to do that this evening. And these are all folks that I have known in various capacities uh, through my own life, through my work at Detroit Disability Power. And they're all super cool. And I was really excited when they were able to comprise our panel tonight. Um, first, I'm gonna read through some quick uh, information about each of them to let you know who's here. We're gonna share some of their information in the chat so you can continue to follow their work um, at another time. Uh, and then I'm gonna come to the panel and ask them to introduce themselves. So. Uh, first, I want to uh, excitedly share that Candace Coleman is here. Uh, she's an organizer from the south side of Chicago, working closely with disabled people affected by the justice system uh, and organizing around racial justice and disability. Uh, she does work around anti-bullying, the school to prison pipeline, restorative justice, police brutality, and deinstitutionalization. She's dedicated to teaching disabled people of color to take pride in all aspects of their identity so they can become leaders themselves. Next up, I'm happy that we have Professor Emily P. Lawson here this evening. Emily is the national president of the Filipino American National Historical Society, as well as an award-winning lecturer at the University of Michigan, where she has taught Women in Gender Studies, American Culture, and Asian Pacific Islander American Studies for the past 21 years. Her reflections on being the mother of an Asian American child who has Down syndrome was published on the cover of Parent Map Magazine. Professor Lawson is a former advisory board member of the Allied Media Conference and the co-founder of the Filipino Youth Initiative in the Detroit Asian Youth Project. So glad you're here, Emily. Thank you. Next we have 
Devin Goldstein, who is a student at Gallaudet University studying the epistemology of intersectionality, gender, sexuality, and disability, and is also the disability access coordinator uh, at the Michigan Organization for Adolescent Sexual Health, also known as MOASH. Uh, this Youth Advisory Council is working on inclusive sex education through organizing and policy change. Uh, we at DDP are a proud partner in this collaboration for the uh, Youth Advisory Council. So glad you're here, Devin. And last but not least, we have uh, my friend and fellow organizer, Jessica Lehman, who serves as the Executive Director of San Francisco Senior and Disability Action, an organization committed to mobilizing seniors and people with disabilities to fight for justice on healthcare, housing, transportation, and other issues. As a person with a disability who employs home attendants, Jessica supports domestic worker rights as a founding member of Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. She leads monthly organizer forum calls as part of the National Disability Leadership Alliance to expand organizing in the disability community and to explore collaboration with other communities. So, so glad to have you, Jessica. Thank you so much for being here. So um, you all can tell I'm excited. Um, and I want to ask you all to introduce yourself real quickly, uh, just, you know, with your name, a pronoun, if you'd like to share your age, a visual description, and then kind of your initial thoughts on what comes to mind for you when you hear the term intergenerational organizing. Uh, what comes to mind? Share some, some things uh, about your own experience collaborating across age. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to start with you, Jessica, what comes to mind for you when thinking about intergenerational organizing? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. It's really an honor. Um, so my name is Jessica Lehman. I use she and her. Um, I am a white woman. I am 44, I think. Um, that sounds right. Um, I have, have straight shoulder length, brown hair, a tiny bit of red lipstick, and which is unusual for me, by the way. And um, you can see the top of a gray t-shirt that's my senior and disability action t-shirt. And then the background is a picture of um, disabled people and older people with protest signs, kind of a silhouette. And it says senior and disability action in the corner. Um, and I have a physical disability. I use a wheelchair, um, have my whole life. Um, so yeah, that's me and my, my description. Um, as far as what comes to mind, so two things, um, you know, I, I mentioned to, to Jessa and the rest of the panel that I think part of me when I hear intergenerational organizing, it puts almost this bad taste in my mouth that I feel like it's often this idea of we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have some younger people showing older people how to use smartphones or how to get on the internet or we're going to have older people help take care of preschoolers um, and this very kind of charity model of like we'll make these groups happy by bringing them together um, but I think the the flip side of that the really positive side um, is that my organization and and my my work are all about bringing seniors and disabled people together because we share so much in terms of our experiences um, being seen as, as disposable and burdensome um, and the, the issues that we deal with, whether it's challenges finding housing um, or getting the home care we need. Um, and so coming together, I think we can have so much power and we can, we can just be so much more effective in getting things done. Yes, this is Dessa. Thank you, Jessica. That's something I, I talk about a lot when I talk about cross-disability solidarity and the importance of working across the, our different disabilities. Um, and I think bringing age into that more consciously is something I want to I want to commit to doing. Um, Candice, I want to turn to you now and, and get you to uh, introduce yourself to the group and also let us know what comes to mind for you when you think about intergenerational organizing. Sure, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Candace Coleman. I am racial justice organizer at Access Living. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And 
I want to make sure I get this introduction right. Um, my visual description, I'm an African-American woman. I have a long face. And actually right now the sun is shining <laughs> on half of my face and the other half is in shadow. Um, I have a short haircut and I have on a blue collared top. Um, the background is actually a image of um, a campaign that we've been working on for the last couple of years um, called the Community Emergency Services and Supports Act. It's an art picture with um, two individuals sitting at a, a park bench uh, having a conversation. Um, the colors um, in the background are, are uh, blue, light blue, um, and the words Community Emergency Services and Supports Act are pink. Um, when I think about intergenerational organizing, um, I agree with everything Jessica said, but in addition to that, I look at it from a strength space of having a collection of wisdom um, in one room and in one space and allowing those different perspectives to influence um, how our society is actually um, and not just imagining from the lens of youth or the lens of um elders but just uh everyone um and hopefully having an opportunity to uh, have a shared space of shared experience to make change um and it does take work to make sure that everyone's voices are uplifted um just as we do um, when we do work for cross disability um we also have to do it uh, across age bracket um just because the way people's uh, social norms have happened in their generation um, has shifted a lot. And so <laughs> adjusting to those changes, but also uh, bringing wisdom um, to how we could all collectively fight together is how I think about intergenerational organizing. This is Dessa, I love it. Thanks so much, Candice. Uh, Emily, I wanna ask you now to introduce yourself and tell us what's on your mind. Thank you, Dessa. Um, I'm Emily Lawson, and I use Sha, which is the Filipino neutral, gender neutral pronoun, uh, or she or hers. Um, I'm in my 50s, but like to say I'm in my 20s. <laughs> and uh, I'm the mother of a child with Down syndrome and a guardian of my brother who has autism. And so have um, been learning from both of them about what it means to be in disability justice movements. Um, my image description, I am Filipino American. I have short black hair. I'm wearing black cat eye eyeglasses, a red top and a black red and white necklace. I'm sitting in front of a black background and next to me in the background is a poster that says no racism stop anti Asian violence 24 hours seven days a week, uh, which is a poster made by my friend Eric Jocelyn out of Philadelphia in 1992 and revived this year after the incidents that have been happening. Um, the question what comes to mind when I hear intergenerational organizing. Uh, what comes to mind is I think of uh, how blessed I've been to have been mentored and to have been raised in different intergenerational type of organizations. Um, the first one being the Filipino youth activities in Seattle, uh, which also led to my involvement in the Filipino American National Historical Society, uh, where you have uh, young folks, children uh, interacting with 80 and 90 year olds and middle aged folks about all there is to know about Filipino Americans. Um, the second thing that comes to mind is um, having been blessed to have learned a lot from Grace Lee Boggs, uh, the late uh, Chinese American activist and scholar and philosopher who founded or was one of the co-founders of Detroit Summer. And I was blessed to have been able to um, volunteer with Detroit Summer and learned um, so much from the young folks and the elders there um, 20 years ago when I moved to Detroit. And uh, we worked on a number of different intergenerational projects. Um, I learned how to garden and make murals. Um, I had never done anything like that in my entire life. And um, I'm thankful to all of the folks in Detroit Summer for teaching me that, teaching me skills that I still 
uh, have and still hold dearly and can teach to my own children now. Um, and that um, also brings up uh, the organizations that came out of Detroit Summer, uh, organizations uh, that I think of are like the Allied Media Projects, um, the Detroit Asian Youth Projects, uh, and Filipino Youth Initiative, uh, the last two of which uh, I helped found. And we modeled after the intergenerational organizing that Det Detroit Summer was doing in Detroit to redefine, respirit, and rebuild Detroit from the ground up. And I just want to say um, salutations and big ups to all the AMP family, the Allied Media Projects family, who've continued the work of Detroit Summer um, to this day. This is Dessa. Thanks so much, Emily. I love how you're bringing in uh, even how organizing and organizations have lineages. Uh, that's that's so cool. And then also how you know this this more holistic perspective of intergenerational learning that out, even you know outside of organizing and power building spaces, but in gardening and in creative endeavors too. That's uh, really lovely. Uh, Devin, I'm excited to have you introduce yourself uh, to our guest tonight as well. Uh, can you share with us who you are and your initial thoughts on intergenerational organizing? Hi, I'm Devin Goldstein. I'm a white person. I have a white shirt. And on the front of my shirt, it says pride. I also have glasses. And a, and a blue head wrap. And on my head wrap, there are stars on it. So when I think about intergenerational organizing, you know, I was very fortunate growing up. You know, I had access to become a leader and I had education to support me. I had a deaf education and I had the deaf community. And you know, that's very generational and there's a lot of culture there. So deaf uh, generational organizing is very important for me. You know, and looking at the death protests in the past and thinking about that now, I've learned so much. And that's been really amazing. And I've had the opportunity to lead with MOASH and work with other youth members like myself. You know, I'm 20 right now, I'm still very young. So working with other youth members in Moash is, has been very vital for me. And, and you know, also my staff. You know, and to have opportunity to work with staff members. You know, and at the same time work with the youth to really make uh, influence. You know, it's been a while since I've worked with other staff members and, you know, focus on inter intergenerational organizing. You know, it's good for me because I'm young and it's so beneficial for me. You know, I can learn from everybody else and grow as a person and I really cherish that opportunity. This is Dessa. Thank you, Devin. And um, as a person who also works with you, I, I think you shouldn't underestimate what you offer to that learning as well. Um, I, 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 I know I'm not alone in knowing how much you bring to spaces. Thank you. Um, all right, y'all. So we're going to take just a five minute break. Uh, do what you need to do. We'll come back at um, 48 after the hour and we'll dive into a deeper conversation with these fantastic panelists that you just met. We'll see you in five minutes. If all, if all of our panelists can turn on their cameras, we can get everyone spotlit and get started with our conversation. 
almost there. We're going to hold tight for one sec. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So, um, Candace, I'm actually going to start with you this time. Um, I want to kind of invite you to think back on the last year and tell us what stands out to you about life at the intersection of age and race and disability. Um, this could be about your own personal experience or something that you've observed, something bigger in the world around you. Uh, what comes to mind for you, Candace? Um, that's actually a very interesting question during the time that we're in right now. Um, because as a disability, as a person that identifies with having multiple disabilities and have all my life, um, I felt like in terms of ageism, we've been put on an even playing field for access needs because we're in a pandemic and because we had to all kind of follow the same protocol. Um, I saw access to rooms open up more um, because we had to use Zoom and telecommunication. Although I do also know that it also excluded people um, due to that, um, the uh, knowledge base of technology um, and having access to that. Um, I saw, um, our society slow down um, and to re-strategize how we move forward. Um, I actually hope that some of that continues because I think it has opened up a space for us to uh, reevaluate how we value time um, and what we use our energy for. Um, I also, uh, just in the social justice arena, a lot of people were um, exposed to some of the injustices that we talk about every day um, in racial justice work. Um, George Floyd uh, being murdered um, and just the masses of people like responding to that, even though I feel like we've been saying this for lifetimes, um, but I think people actually recognize or saw the injustice in a way that, I don't know. I don't wanna say that they've never seen it before, but just people have paid attention. Um, and I think uh, the definition of, of productivity is starting to change. I think um, where people felt like we physically needed to be able to do things or physically needs to be in space, uh, that is no longer the case anymore. And so, um, I think how we look look at access has expanded to communities that don't normally think about that. And so I actually hope that it furthers the conversation on how we could create access across the board, regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not. Um, those are just a few things that I noticed. Oh, and the last thing is that when we talk about intergenerational, um, the experiences that we've been experiencing, whether you are an elder or a young person, um, has been able to be talked to. Um, people have been more communicating about this experience and the various things that we've experienced in the past and what we could possibly experience in the future. Um, so it has, it has opened up intergenerational conversations as well. Just in a few things. Yeah, just a few. This is Dessa. Just a few uh, really great <laughs> things there. <laughs> Candace, thank you for, for kicking us off. Um, Emily, I'd love to hear from you what this experience has been like from, from your experience and what you've noticed about the world. This is Emily. Thank you, Dessa. And thank you, Candace. I completely agree with everything that Candace said. Uh, when I think of this question, I, I think of my own personal experience. I think about how the pandemics um, have impacted my Filipina Japanese American daughter, who is immunocompromised, has had several surgeries in her young life, and who has Down syndrome, uh, yet is too young to be vaccinated, right? Um, the grief is so much that during this last year, has been so much during this last year for all of us, um, but the loss of friends, um, the loss of family, the loss of engagement in a classroom um, for 
two years now has been really devastating. And at the same time, uh, the last two years have been the first time that none of us in the household have caught other ailments that we normally would at this time of year, right? Cold, strep throat, flu. I mean, we were at the doctor's office every month um, or every few weeks um, when it wasn't the pandemic. So the irony of that um, is quite striking to me, um, but it's also, um, it's also a little bit humbling to me too, to, to, to realize the, the impact that, that the movements, you know, f for social justice right now um, has had on, on everything. Yeah, thanks. This is Dessa. Thank you, Emily. Um, I I feel like there are there are so many ironies that abound in these in these months. Um, sometimes I don't even know how to. I mean, sometimes I don't know if I should be crying or laughing. It's just confusing uh, and emotional. Um, appreciate you bringing that in, uh, Devin. You know, what's this experience been like for you? What reflections do you want to share with the group about what you've experienced and observed? Yes, this is Devin speaking. So um, I um, identify myself as deaf plus, which means that I do have, uh, of course, deafness and then physical disabilities to go along with that. So um, I don't really have permission to go to the doctor in person. Um, I, if I have any issues, have to go directly to the hospital to receive care in the hospital. Uh, so it's a fairly weekly process for me to go to the hospital. Um, and when I go there, I see what's happening, um, especially firsthand with the pandemic, um, talking about interpreters, for example. Well, because of COVID, you cannot have extra bodies or unnecessary people in your area. Well, an interpreter is absolutely a necessity for me. So my friends, if they're not able to, if an interpreter is not able to show up, sometimes they will say, well, your friend is here. You can have your friend interpret and we'll have to use things like FaceTime. And it's, it's just not working. There are so many um, positive changes as well, of course. I mean, in regards to safety, we're talking about some positive changes. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like, you know, those who are immunocompromised, for example, whether they have multiple disabilities or are elderly, um, the medical care that um, they have been asking for seems to be now a little bit more normalized because we're recognizing the need for all of us. So, having that sense of understanding that there are people who have access needs, that there are people who have medical needs that uh, have to go to the hospital. Uh, we're recognizing that importance, uh, especially for those who are elderly and those with disability, that access that um, has been prevented uh, for them prior to this pandemic where they would normally stay home or wouldn't have the ability to make it to the hospital. It seems like now we are making some progress where there are rides available. There is more availability for those who have disability and again, the uh, elderly. And that's maybe a positive takeaway from COVID. Uh, also, there's that sense of togetherness, right? We're all fighting COVID together. This is Dessa. Thank you, Devin. And I really, one of the things I appreciate about what you just shared is, is so many non-disabled people don't think about what it's like to go to the doctor as a person that's deaf or with disabilities and don't necessarily know, you know, how much labor, emotional labor and time goes into navigating these uh, inaccessible processes and systems. And um, I, I love though also how you talked about the fact that um, other people, non-disabled people are now more aware of having a body and a mind that requires care because of COVID. And that's something that 
for those of us who have to think our, about our bodies all day uh, already knew it's in, but it's a it's a real a new reality for some people in a kind of body way that I think is really really interesting to think about. Um, so we want to shift the conversation just a little bit, you know. So here we've got this context of what we. Uh, oh, actually, <laughs> Jessica. Uh, before we shift the conversation, I'd love to hear. I was getting skipped. <laughs> My apologies. Kidding. No, yeah. Tell us what's going on with you. Tell us about your experience. Um, no, I I could get skipped because what what all the other speakers said was was amazing and really resonated with me. Um, just want to add on to a couple of the, of things that that were talked about. So, um, you know, Candace was talking about the racial justice protests that happened at the beginning of the pandemic, and that you know it was not the first time that there were um, particularly black men killed by police, um, but so many more people were paying attention than before. And I think for those of us in disability communities to be talking about how it was black people with mental health disabilities who are the, the most likely to be shot and killed by police, um, you know, that also hasn't really sunk in, but because of COVID and people kind of getting in touch with their own mental health and recognizing that it's a big deal and people started to talk about mental health more, I think that had a lot of really powerful impacts. Um, so one of the things I shared earlier um, was, or was shared about me in my, my intro was a, a podcast that a few of us did, or I don't know what it was, a, a radio piece um, about COVID and the impact on people with disabilities and older people. Um, and so I, I talked then about how I think the pandemic really saw the, like the full and terrifying potential impact of ageism, ableism, and racism that we know all of our communities get um, get ignored and get compounded when we share um, share those oppressions, and you know we saw that coming to the extreme, which was people dying. And at the beginning of the pandemic, as people were trying to understand what was going on, there were articles about, oh, it's it's only killing older people and disabled people, so you don't have to worry, right? As if the people reading the news, the people that matters are not old or disabled and so they don't matter. And then it wasn't until months later that it came out that not only were old and disabled people dying more, but particularly those of color. Um, and that has continued to be far underreported and, and misunderstood. Um, so in, in California, we, we worked really hard to fight care rationing. And now we're seeing this come back in Idaho and Alaska and other states where um, states and hospitals are deciding who should get an ICU bed or who should get um, oxygen if there is not enough for everyone who needs it. And the assumption is that those who don't have as many years left to live or those who are presumed to have a lower quality of life um, should be lower on the list for treatment. And it was kind of, you know, for those of us that know that mainstream society assumes that our lives are, are less valuable, are, are tragic, are pathetic. You know, it was like, now we're seeing the full um, manifestation of that. And then with voting, it was really interesting to see it as well in the pandemic where um, so many nursing homes, um, I should say skilled nursing facilities because they're not homes, had been polling places and they weren't because of the huge number of people in nursing facilities who died of COVID. Um, I wish I had that percentage, but just you know, an appalling percentage that, that we all should know it should be in the news and it's just not. Um, and that we know that disabled people are less likely to vote and black and brown people are less likely to vote. And so we were looking at what happens to older people, particularly older people of color, who are in nursing facilities where they basically lost their right to vote in the 2020 election because nobody figured their vote mattered. Um, and so it was, it was these kinds of things where we really saw how these oppressions act together and saw the power of our communities coming together to fight them. Thanks, this is Dessa. Thanks, Jessica. Um, you know, and I think one other thing about the voting that's interesting is how the way that many places in Michigan is a good example where uh, polling oppor or voting opportunities became more expansive and abundant because of the precautions of COVID uh, and the decision to protect people by encouraging more absentee voting, 
um, and, and other things at the polling locations actually made it more accessible for disabled people to vote. And that was like such a great uh, thing that we wanna to try to keep in place. And of course there are, there are folks working very much to dismantle that expansion and access. Um, thank, yeah, thank you all. So, you know, this kind of moves us right into the next question that I have for you, which is about our culture and our, and our social justice movements in particular. Um, I, you know, I want to hear from you and, and <clears throat> we'll start with you, Devin, this time. Uh, how do you see ageism and ableism reinforce each other in our culture, in our movements? So the interplay between ageism and ableism how do they show up in social justice and social change work? And at the same time, how can our movements better build solidarity across ages and disability status? So I just wanted to let everyone know that I'm cold. So I put on a sweater. Uh, so my image is a little bit different now. So I see a lot of contradictions, but I have seen improvement in the disability community. So related to ageism, oh, sorry, ableism. So I've seen, you know, contradictions in the doctor's office. So much, you know, time is just to get access to the doctor. You know, they'll say things like, oh, you're young, you know, that only happens to older people. You know, but, you know, they're telling me things that are wrong with me, you know, and they're saying like, oh, that would only happen to an old person, but I'm not old, I just have a disability. You know, it's hard to, for disabled people to get the care that they want. You know, sometimes you give them things that could help them, but you're still labeled as a disability, as having a disability. You know, but, you know, technology has helped but I still get things like, why don't you try harder? Or maybe someone in a wheelchair, you try to encourage them to walk and you know, it's, it's, you know, for me, like, why do I have to walk if it hurts to walk? You know, that's bad for me. And if I use a wheelchair, I can live my life. I can go to school, Ed, I can go to work. Turn the TV down just a little, please. Oops. So I think the idea that uh, the old is bad or disabled is bad. You know, that's, that's, you know, pretty awful. And it's, it's just, you know, just the concept of being bad. You know, hopefully we can change that perspective and, you know, reduce ageism and ableism. And stop that connection with being old is bad or being disabled is bad. Yeah, this is Dessa. Thanks, Devin. That's a great, like, great basis for, for this conversation because uh, I've just, I, I can't help but notice all the time how the default assumption, of, as you're saying about disability, or those who are uh, older have more years behind them, that that's a bad thing. Um, and when, when we implicitly have that bias, we are uh, missing out on so many opportunities uh, to, to be more respectful of people, to make the world better, to learn from each other. Um, it's so prevalent for that assumption to be negative. 
And then I also really want to uplift what you said in the beginning about uh, people assuming that youth equals health um, and that age equals disability. And that is um, only to, true to some degree, of course. And we're, many of us are living a different experience. Um, Emily, I'd like to hand it over to you and, and get your reflections on how you, see, how you see ageism and ableism reinforcing each other culturally and, and particularly in social movements. Thank you, Dessa. This is Emily. I was thinking a lot about this question and it's, it's something I don't like to think about because it's such a, a problem, uh, especially in uh, communities of color, especially in uh, Filip our Filipino American community where we are taught to revere our elders, right? Uh, and yet, sometimes when you work with elders and as an elder i know uh, uh, or as someone in my middle age i should say um it's hard <laughs> it's 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 a challenge um and there are a lot of contradictions that come come out um when you're doing social justice movement and racial justice you know especially uh movement activism i think of uh what grace lee boggs wrote 10 years ago when you know she was she was probably um, at that age you know close to 90 95 <laughs> years old she died at 100 um, but she she wrote that these are the times that grow our souls right and she was talking about a, a lot of different other issues at the time but those those issues still exist uh, today, um, and, and that quote is actually uh, the title chapter uh, in her book, The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century. Uh, and full disclosure, she co-wrote that with my my partner, uh, Scott Kurashige. Uh, but I think of that quote often, right? That these are the times that grow our souls, and especially now, um, and what that means right, and how we um, of different abilities and different ages can learn that um, or, or apply that to our organizing. Um, there's also a, another quote that a lot of people have been circulating, especially during the pandemics, um, also attributed to Grace, uh, Grace Lee Boggs, that she said on, on one of her television interviews, she said, the only way we can survive is by taking care of one another. And I think she said that on Democracy Now, on one of the episodes on Democracy Now. And if you think about that, you know, when she said it, we weren't in a pandemic. Um, but here we are, and that still remains true. Thank you. Certainly, this is Dessa. Thank you, Emily. Uh, couldn't be more true. Could not be more true, um, Jessica. For you, what have you what have you observed about how these bolster each other, ableism and ageism? I am eager to hear from you since this is what your organization does: dismantle both. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's certainly what we're working on. Um, I think, unfortunately, what we see is sometimes in an effort to fight ageism, people reinforce ableism and vice versa, and particularly we see it in um, pictures of, of, you know, older people with gray hair who are skydiving or climbing mountains. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a, this is what, this is what being older looks like, or I'm 80, you know, what of it. Right. Um, and, and it's this idea of, oh, change what you're thinking about older people. You know, we're still active and healthy, right. We're not disabled. Um, and, and so I, I think that, that the folks that have that are doing that work are starting to recognize that it it's harmful to disabled people to be talking about older people in that way. Um, and that it doesn't do older people any favors either, because a lot of older people are disabled or will become disabled. Um, and that everyone should should be able to be part of the, the older community and not feel like they only matter if they're um, climbing mountains. Um, you know, in, in San Francisco, 
we are lucky that we have we have a lot more um, services and programs around senior and disability um, issues and um, and resources than in a lot of places. And then sometimes we end up in this weird like, well, why are there so many things for seniors? Why do they always leave out people with disabilities? Um, you know, which is sometimes true, but I think it's also one of the ways that we kind of let our communities be pitted against each other um, instead of really coming together to say, okay, so we know that that we're all treated in some similar ways. Um, what can what can we do about it? Um, and I think it's just, you know, kind of the that natural tendency that if we're already stigmatized in one way, we want to avoid others. Um, but we just have to kind of recognize how how that that's not going to help us in the long run. And I think there's just so much that our communities can learn from each other um, in terms of older people learning about independent living, you know, which like the name, I think, needs to change at some point. But you know, the idea that that disabled people and all people can get assistance and can still be in charge of their lives, right, and, and are contributing uh, members of society and of our communities. And I say contribute, and I don't mean in a, a capitalist, like you have to work and pay taxes sense, but that we all are, are giving of ourselves in different ways. Um, and, you know, to see disability as a way of being, like how much would that change the experience of getting older if you weren't afraid of being disabled? And interestingly, I've learned a lot from working with older people. And I think sometimes older people really share this idea that it can be okay to be cared for. Um, that, I mean, there's a whole conversation about the word care and mutual care and how do we look at it. But I think both older people and disabled people often see that we have to ask for help, although we all struggle with it in different ways. Um, and we can learn a lot from each other about how to do that. Yes, awesome. This is Dessa. Thanks, Jessica. Gonna move it over to you, Candace, to get some reflections on how you see ageism and ableism reinforcing each other. I got a lot of thoughts, but I think initially when folks started talking, uh, what came to my mind is during this pandemic, how they were blaming various age brackets for the reason why COVID was spreading. Um and then also blaming communities of color because they didn't get the vaccine. <laughs> um, and then um, when we talk about those intersections plus poverty, so not having access to various things um, and not having time to react because we're in survivor mode. Um, and so because we're in survival mode, we don't have the luxury of time to plan ahead. Um, and so I think all of those elements play out in how we fight for social justice causes. Because one, we don't have enough bandwidth to de deal with all the oppression and trauma that we have to fight because we're surviving. Um, the other thing that I think about is even when we talk about like the, the voting rights and how our people in, in past generations fought for that and how it's like right in front of our faces being snatched away. And what are we doing as a young generation to maintain those things? And um, literally asking the questions on how we have to fight for the bare minimum of what we're offered. Um, and how do we work together to do that? And I think we are still struggling to create access and to not silence various voices of different age brackets in all social justice sectors. Um, and so it, it's, it's playing out that we're all stretched too thin <laughs> to, to, to plan ahead and we're in very reactive modes on fighting for very small, minor things. Candace, this is Dusty. You're breaking my heart because uh, it's true. And I feel that like every day, um, which is really kind of what the, the, the next and final question for you all as panelists is before we move in just about five minutes into some breakout groups. So 
everyone gets to talk about this together. Um, many of us, you know, have been around an organizing culture know that it could be brutal and exhausting. Uh, there's a lot of stress. There are long hours. Um, as Candace said, there's, you know, our own trauma and marginalization to deal with um, in the process of trying to make the world better for ourselves and people we care about. There's pain and heartache, um, toxic behavior, right? I mean, it's not even just this, you know, some of this stuff is just people are hard to work with. Um, and so the, the question for you all, the wisdom that we're asking for you all to share is what strengths do you see uh, people from different generations bringing to our social justice movement spaces to make spaces to make them healthier? So what do you see people from various generations do to make our social justice movement spaces healthier and safer and more care centered specifically? Um, and then particularly, you know, what wisdom does disability justice bring to movements uh, in terms of wisdom to help us prevent burnout um, and that kind of thing? So, um, you know, <laughs> who wants to go first? Does anybody want to jump into this question about some of the, the problems in our movements, but also kind of quickly transition us to what are some, some wisdoms and experiences we've seen that have been positive? All right, Jessica, yes, thank you. Um, cut me off if I talk too long. I love this question because I've been doing community organizing for 20 years and I used to work for ACORN, which older people may know. Um, we typically worked um, 10 hour days. I'm like, is that right? Yeah, that's right, 10 hour days. Um, and when I started, I think I was making less than 20,000 a year. And that was organizing culture, right? And that is still often what's considered organizing culture. And it was a lot of young people. I was certainly one of the only ones with a physical disability, um, but that's hard on folks, obviously. We know that here, but that doesn't get talked about. And it was hard on me as a disabled person. And I continue to have to find ways to reshape kind of, you know, typical organizing jobs to make them work for my body and recognizing that, that there are things that work for my body that aren't going to work for others. Um, and this idea that, that every young person can do that. And so we'll let young people work, you know, 60 hours a week and that's fine. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't serve any of us. And I think disability communities offer so much by pushing back against that and saying, we need to take care of ourselves, all of ourselves. And that means taking breaks. That means being intentional. It means, yes, having urgency around the issues that affect all of us, but urgency doesn't mean that we don't take care of ourselves. It means we take turns. Um, and I think a lot of that came out in the, the pandemic as well as people started talking more about mental health. Um, but I think we have a long way to go. And I think we are the ones, like those of us in this room in particular, to actually come up with some new models of organizing and activism that are sustainable. Yes, that's my hope as well. Thanks, Jessica. This is Dessa. Um, Devin, I'd love to learn from you um, where you see things falling apart and where you see us doing stuff better. Yeah, I think this is a really um, good question. I enjoy this question, um, especially with the amount of mistakes <laughs> that I have uh, made and seen. Um, there are a lot of mistakes that I have been involved in, uh, specifically talking about that working to the point of exhaustion. And I get exhausted, I get burnt out, but then I get out and do it again and again and again. And especially thinking about this last year uh, with all the protesting that we've been doing, um, and everything that's happened in New York City, I was doing quite a bit of protesting there. So uh, that work is very uh, laborious. It's very physical. And yes, it's worth it. But I'm a disabled person and I have to take care of myself. I, I, I'm going to continue to try and put forth the effort, of course. Um, and then uh, again, I moved to Michigan uh, to find work here. Um, I had a decent network here. So when I moved, it was important for me to find um, work that um, 
that was suitable for me, I found Moash, which was a huge part of, um, you know, making that decision, uh, uh, not only making the decision, but making that job accessible uh, for myself and for other staff to have access to me as well. So um, for me, for example, email is not very good, but texting is more accessible for me. So the staff have accommodated. Um, also, we have limits for the work that we're doing. We can't work over a certain amount of hours. The expectations are more realistic. Certainly we aim high, but we don't wanna to work to that point of exhaustion. If we realize the workload has become too much, we are able to say no. And um, we are being paid in a way that is fair and equal to that amount of work. Uh, we are very conscientious of of the amount of hours that go into it. Because yes, MOASH is a youth organization. We do have interns, uh, but we also have a maximum amount of hours <laughs> that uh, we feel is suitable for the amount of pay that we're making. So again, as an individual with disabilities, um, working over that amount of hours, especially e even for those who are young, um, I think it's wrong. Honestly, I know it's wrong. And I think it's important for us as a youth organization to teach other organizations that focus on the youth, the importance of having a cap for hours, the importance of, you know, being very well informed. You don't have to work anymore. You don't have to work overtime. You have a max, you have a limit of hours. When you hit that amount, stop. That's okay. And it's important to know that, especially for the newer generations who are coming up, they need to learn that it's okay to stop. This is Dustin. Thanks for sharing that uh, wisdom, Devin. I think everyone, um, <laughs> a lot. I'll speak for myself. I need to hear that. I need to continue working on that. Um, and it's something that matters to me a lot. And it's also um, challenging. So, Thanks for the reminder. Um, Emily, I'd, I'd like to ask you to weigh in here um, about what strengths you see people bringing to making our movements healthier and any thoughts you have about disability in particular in that conversation. Thank you, Dessa. This is Emily. I was thinking about this question and, you know, as a mother, <laughs> Oh, when I became a mother, I, I should say before I became a mother, I didn't quite understand the meaning of exhaustion <laughs> as much as I do now. And uh, it's a privilege. It's a blessing. Um, but it's also exhausting. <laughs> and um, I think about this question of intergenerational organizing. And one of the great things that I learned from young folks, I was actually on a panel once and um, a, a student asked uh, those of us uh, who are organizers, what do you do for self care? <laughs> and I had honestly never ever thought that about that question. And I never had that question asked in a panel before. And I really had to think about it. And that's when I knew how exhausted I really was. Um, I forgot how I answered it. I, I don't, I don't, I forgot what I, I, I even forgot how I said, I might have said massage <laughs> uh, or something. Um, but I, I really think about also, you know, our, my time with Detroit Summer, the, the youth organizing um, organization that I mentioned earlier. And how, uh, you know, I mentioned we, we did murals in community gardens and a lot of people used to poo poo that, that that wasn't um, organizing, right? Well, we did that in the Cass Corridor, which is now Midtown in Detroit, right? Um, and urban gardening is all now the rage, right? When we were doing organic gardening uh, 20, 20, 25 years ago. But I also think about the, 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 the other, um, aspects of Detroit summer that were were around then that I learned um, self care from, 
you know, the, the, the practice of community dinners that we used to have once a week um, where anybody could come and we would take the, the organic um, vegetables from the garden that we had harvested that day and prepare a community dinner and have conversations, right? And people would poo poo that too, but that's part of organizing, right? That's part of intergenerational organizing. That's how we learn to uh, about issues that are going on in the community, in the garden, um, in our neighborhoods, uh, in the world. And that's also how we sustain ourselves, right? It's how we fed ourselves. It's also how uh, I learned how to cook a lot of great foods that I never knew how to cook before. So, you know, um, that is a practice that I think um, is part of also food justice, right? Organizing, especially in Detroit, shout out to all, uh, you know, our friends who are in that movement. Um, that's important because, you know, Detroit was known as a, as a food desert, uh, for so long. Um, the also, the, the other thing I also want to commend, um, organizers for in this day and age is the use of technology and how that also allows us to say no. Oh, my technology is not working right now. I, I got to go. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the use of text. Oh, yeah, sorry. I can't help you with that. It's so much easier to say no for me now as an Asian American uh, woman than it was 20 years ago when I didn't have that technology. Yeah, this is Dessa. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, I, I, one of the things I'm thinking about is what you said about those dinners and, and how people don't think about that as part of organizing. And when I look back at the history of organizing and when it's been the strongest, it's when people were building relationships with their, with their families as part of it, with their communities in a kind of deep and meaningful way outside of this kind of very narrow definition of what some of us do professionally for organizing. Um, so I, I think that's a great reminder. Um, Candice, I love your reflections. And then I just want to make a, a quick note because of time, we're actually going to scrap the breakout room and we're going to have questions for the panel from, from the audience, um, which was something we were going to do after the breakout room anyway, but, uh, and then, so we'll hear from Candice, we'll take some questions. So get your questions queued up if you have them. Um, and then we'll do some singing before we close. Um, all right, so sorry, sorry for the interruption, Candace, but um, what are your thoughts on this in terms of the health of our movements and what disability justice has to offer? I think we talked about what bothers us about the health of our movements, but I think what brings us together, at least what I'm recognizing now, um, being in coalition with partners who don't think about um, disability as much is the um, point of disability justice about uh, collective access. Um, I was talking to a community partner a couple of weeks ago and they pulled me to the side and asked me a series of questions as it related to how to create access for themselves to the rest of the organization as a person whose body is changing and shifting in different ways. Um, and I remember explaining to her like, because you all value each other, <laughs> it is okay for you to share what you need um, in order to be in space. Um, and it is okay to ask everyone to be supportive of that. And it just literally blew her mind. Um, she didn't even think that she had space to ask, um, nor did she think of it being valuable enough um, and so I think um, the collective access is something that's really great for our movements. Um, I also think that we are moving more towards recognizing wholeness um, for different um, identities and experiences. Um, I think that's uh, being more prevalent now. I'm not going to like be in a uh, fantasy world to say it's across the board. It's not. But at least in spaces I'm in, I could definitely say that we're intentional about uh, doing that work. Um, and I think that allows the different perspectives from various walks of life to contribute to um, space sustainability, um, social justice movements, 
um, and have voice uh, to the issues that we're, we're fighting every day. And I'm gonna keep it short because I know we're running out of time. Oh, this is Dessa. We're good. Y'all are great. Um, one of the things I was just thinking thinking about as you were saying that, Candace, was about how because so many of us spend so much time on Zoom with people from all over the country and the world, I think some of the cultural practices around stating what we need, uh, visual description, saying our name before we, that stuff seems to be spreading super fast. Uh, and I think that's a really cool kind of, un, I think, unintended consequence of um, you know, everything that's happening with COVID and technology, but also as disability justice movements become more visible and powerful, uh, we are like very clearly uh, impacting culture, which is really cool to be a part of. Um, so like I said, we're gonna take some questions um, from our guests this evening. Um, so if you have a question, you should feel free to put it in the chat if that's accessible to you. If that's not accessible to you, if you could raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, and I'm gonna read the question that came into the chat just now from Tyler. Um, Tyler writes, what in your opinion is the most important trait to maintain a strong intergenerational community or organization? So what do we need to do to build strong intergenerational communities or organizations? And any or all panelists, feel free to, to weigh in on this, but um, you tell me if you're ready and, and wanna dig into this question. There's, I'm gonna read one more question in the chat that's similar um, from Casey, who says, similar to Tyler's question, uh, what have been your favorite activities or events to build intergenerational relationships? So what does it take? And maybe what's an example of, of something that's been positive for you? Anybody wanna kick us off? This is Candace. Um, so I think one of the traits um, that one of the traits that should be maintained in intergenerational community organizing is actually mutual respect. <laughs> um, I find that, um, again, due to differences of opinions, differences of experiences, um, how new and creative things can be scary for some people. Um, sometimes people cannot be open uh, to new ideas um, and new uh, way. Um, and so I think mutual respect and really the principle that we all started out at the beginning of this, um, this uh, presentation, which is that we're not gonna solve everything um in this space um that we're gonna be uncomfortable <laughs> um and that we have to we we should respect each other's voice and opinion um i think is 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 a, at least a core value for intergenerational organizing some core values for intergenerational organizing uh thanks candace this is dessa it's making me think you know I, i'm originally from the south and um, it was definitely a, a part of my cultural upbringing to respect my elders uh, and to say ma'am and sir. And um, there's so much of that that I really value, but I also, to the mutual respect point, didn't always feel as a young person that I got the respect back from my elders. Uh, and, and to this day, I know elders who expect a level of respect that they don't dish out. And that's really hard. And um, it's very, it's been very difficult for me to navigate that because I want to respect my elders, but I also don't want to be treated poorly. Um, and I think that can be hard to figure out in movement space and that commitment to mutual respect would be great. Uh, but patience is certainly required. Uh, Jessica, I see your hand. I would say one of the, I don't know if this is the most important, but one thing is that we have to name it. Like we need to talk about being intentional about bringing together people of different ages and and disabled and non-disabled people and people of color. Um, you know, it's like, it's, people are like, oh, but we didn't exclude anyone, right? It doesn't happen on its own. And we need to be talking about it, right? And then we need to acknowledge what does it look like in that space? And what are the different forms of oppression we experience? And what are the ideas and the power that we all bring to it? Um, and just having those discussions, I think goes a long way. 
Yes, Devin. So, you know, like a project that I enjoy, I work with my access. And this is my consent month. And there was a workshop in September. And there were older people there as well as young people. And we had some honest discussions. And, you know, people got to really discuss their different experiences, so, you know, as a disabled person going to school, you know, and older people and younger people contributed to that discussion. And so just hearing those different experiences in that discussion and, you know, all that sharing was valuable. you know, and trying to figure out what's the best way that we can all be together in that space and understand one another. You know, that was a very valuable experience for me. This is Dessa. Thanks so much, Devin. Um, we have another, Emily, do you want to weigh in on this? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Miriam who writes, what would disability justice look like in K-12 schools if we consider ageism and ableism? What would be the first concrete action to start organizing through an intergenerational perspective in schools? What a beautiful question. Um, does anybody, who wants to jump in? This is like a massive and awesome question. Oh, Devin, yeah, let's, thank you. So MOASH, the organization that I work with, does do some of that work in K through 12 education. So we specifically focus on sexual education in the K through 12 uh, community as well. You know, just listening to young people and giving them a voice. Yeah, and this is for all K through 12 students. You know, all of their voices are important. You know, and you know, we mentioned mutual respect, so it can kind of start there, I think. You know, especially in public schools, you know, catching them early and really listening to what they have to say. You know, maybe they don't have the financial support that they need. So we want to really make sure that we focus on the voice of the student and show that we're listening to them. You know, because in the future, they're going to have to work with older people and they might experience some type of block. So getting those discussions out early would be great. Thanks so much, Devin. This is Dessa. Um, any of our other uh, panelists want to weigh in on this question about schools, ageism and ableism in schools? Nobody is too young for political education. Just start talking about it. This is Dessa. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, that's that's true. There's. Um, you know, with, with all the conversations of, around critical race uh, theory being taught in schools right now, um, I'd love if somebody wants to touch on that a little bit. But, um, you know, I I very much remember growing up in schools and not seeing disabled people reflected in anything that I learned. Um, and so, you know, one concrete thing that comes to mind uh, for me is like actually teaching about disability and, al and also teaching about disability rights. Um, history. You know, we've, we've been doing this for a while, like there's certainly enough to uh, include it in the textbooks. 
um, and what that would do for the uh, self-esteem of young disabled kids um, and what that would do for their peers in terms of educating them about who we are and what we need um, it would be super powerful. Uh, and yeah, it never, no, not too young. There's a, there's a book called We All Move Together. It's a kid's picture book, which um, I will try to put a, a link to in the chat in a moment, but uh, DDP did, did the um, first book reading of this book with the authors and the illustrators a few months ago. And it's just a beautiful book of, of four children about uh, the concept of not leaving others behind. Uh, maybe because they move differently or move slowly or communicate differently. It's just really well done. Um, Emily, um, yeah. I love all that. Thank you, Dessa. Uh, this is Emily. You know, as, as an educator, uh, I, I teach ethnic studies and uh, women and gender studies, and it's a constant struggle, right? Um, and as a mother, right, uh, I learned all these new things about how you know disabled students or students with disabilities are treated um when my child you know first entered the public school system i had no idea what an iep was uh individualized education plan um but i learned a lot from disability justice activists uh, particularly janice fialka and uh, Micah Fialka uh, Feldman. And I was completely inspired by them and still am uh, and their work. You know, Micah, if you don't know, um, you know, he was also part of Detroit Summer, but uh, he, he fought to live in the dorms to go to school at Oakland University. So, you know, and won, I, I, you know, and, um, just the notion of access, accessibility, and all the other things that have been discussed today uh, that people don't want to think about, right? Um, because it's either too hard or uh, too difficult or whatever reasons they have, it's just all messed up. Um, but it's something that we need to think about um, as social justice activists um, and that, that I think about every day as a parent. Thanks. Anybody else like to weigh in on this question? School systems are interesting because of the power dynamics. And um, I think one of the things that could be done is shifting those power dynamics and giving students voice and choice to make some decisions. Um, in areas that they know they experience and they want to see change. Um, that's and when you were speaking earlier, I remember when I was doing youth organizing, um, I organized a curricula for first to third graders to learn about disability rights and disability justice movements. And by the time we got done um, having conversations with them and classes with them, they actually became advocates to create more access for their school and their community. One of their first projects was actually making the Starbucks door a push button accessible <laughs> that they knew that a lot of people uh, frequented across the street and they were actually successful at um, making that change. Um, and so I believe that when we teach young people the truth about what our society is and who it reflects, um, they grow up advocating and recognizing um, things that need to change faster than we do as we get older. Um, and so I, there's power in doing exactly what you said, which is to teach them about disability rights and disability justice and disability community in general. I like how you said, uh, teach them the truth about things. Um, so the combination of truth and critical thinking, I mean, that's pretty excellent foundation for creating a better world right there. Um, so I wanna read a couple of things in the chat and then we're probably gonna move uh, on to hearing some singing um, and perhaps singing along. Um, Belinda says it appears that we need to fight for these groups like we did for inclusion of special education students in the regular classroom. 
Uh, Elaine says, children can never have too many grandmas and grandpas and extra aunts and uncles. Children have always responded to me as a person with disabilities when I have been invited to classes, which I've done for decades, sing alongs, build community and understanding. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Um, Tyler writes, Candace, that's a wonderfully awesome success story. I personally have wanted disability rights and an ableism course taught in public schools as a standard requirement. That's amazing to hear. Yeah, yes, it is. Thank you all so much, uh, panelists. You all have given us so much to think about and reflect on. Thank you for sharing your experience and your wisdom. Um, and I'm sorry that we didn't have time for our breakout this evening. Um, some people love breakouts, other people all leave the Zoom call, um, but we were gonna do it. <laughs> um, but we just, we had too much other good stuff to talk about. So um, I wanna introduce uh, Elaine to you all. Elaine um, is, I see ready, is that a, do you have a guitar already with you, Elaine? Is this, do I see a guitar? Oh, okay. Um, we're gonna I'm get- just, I'm just gonna sing. Okay, all right. So we're gonna spotlight Elaine now. Uh, so she's more visible um, and she's gonna sing two songs with us. And um, I'm, I'm excited because one of them is about uh, loving being a crone, um, which is- <laughs> All right, Elaine, uh, please take it away. Well, see, I, I kind of um, complained a little bit earlier that you didn't have any elders officially on, but that's why I barged in, because you have to have at least one elder that's a real elder, and that would be me. I'm 72, so that counts. Anyway, I'm a songwriter. Those of you who don't know me, um, I've been at it for a while, but it's been a kind of really fascinating to me because this COVID thing has stimulated so much creativity. I think that um, artistic people uh, get stimulated in crisis situations. And I just, it's just pouring out of me, all different kinds of things, poetry and songs and everything. So the one out, first one I want to share with you is called Compassionate Inclusion. And this one was very specifically inspired. Um, there was a PBS story about aging caregivers and folks with disabilities on waiting lists. And this song came through me and I put it in those terms because I'm a channel and sometimes it just feels like I'm just taking dictation. And this was one of those songs. It was July 20th through 22nd, 2020. Is that enough 20s for you? Anyway, I know a lot of stuff and I pay attention, but when I heard this, I was stunned and the song just emerged. The report said, that there are half a million certified disabled people waiting on waiting lists right now. A half a million. Wow. Well, that's the song. So now the chorus is, some are essential, some are expendable, some are both, and that's the truth. Compassionate inclusion means caring for everyone, the elders and disabled, the children, and the youth. Now, it looks like everybody is muted because it does get a little wacky if you're not. Are you ready? Just indicate, wave a little bit that you're ready. Yes! Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Half a million certified disabled folks wait on waiting lists year after year. Among the ones affected by budget cuts, never important, that is clear. Families and helpers make do with very little. Most of our families are completely unpaid. Everybody knows we qualify for services. The ones who really care are very, very 
afraid. Because some are essential, some are expendable, some are both, and that's the truth. Compassionate inclusion means caring for everyone, the elders and disabled, children and the youth. Sometimes you give us a good pilot program, we really, really like it, then you take it away. You tell us to be patient, you're sorry for the waiting list. We wait a year or more. We need help today. Millions of us who are out in the community can't seem to get all the help we need. Help your neighbor, help your family. Anyone who helps is a friend indeed. Now I can't see most of you, but some of you, are, come on, sing along a little bit, please. Some are essential, some are expendable, some are both, and that's the truth. Compassionate inclusion means caring for everyone, the elders and disabled, children and the youth. Lots of our folks are trapped in institutions. Many would like to be free instead. The latest problem, the virus is spreading. If they don't get out, they could soon be dead. Let's not forget the ones in prison. Many of them are disabled too. More of us now are broke and homeless. Wait a few months, it might be you. Now you could at least clap your hands. Come on, you can do that. Some are essential, some are expendable, some are both, and that's the truth. Compassionate inclusion means caring for everyone, the elders and disabled, children and the youth. All right, that's getting to it. Now you see we're getting to be a community. Compassionate inclusion means no exceptions, no one's unwelcome, no one has to hide. Sharing love and truth, everything is possible. Everyone can live with dignity and pride. Well, around the world we are one great family. We do the best we can, we sing life song. Nobody's perfect, we're in this together. We're part of the universe, we all belong. Now we're gonna do the chorus two times, so come on now. Clap your hands, dance a little bit, sing, whatever you wanna do. Some are essential, some are expendable, some are both, and that's the truth. Compassionate inclusion means caring for everyone, the elders and disabled, children and the youth. Grand finale, are you ready? <clears throat> some are essential, some are expendable, some are both, and that's the truth. Compassionate inclusion means caring for everyone, the elders and disabled, children and the youth. And that means everyone. Woo. All right, thanks Elaine. I know you got one more. Can you can you yep. round us out and then we'll close it out. Thank you. All righty then. Well, then this one is <clears throat> There was a song for many, many years ago called I enjoy being a girl I never liked it it was all the girly girl stuff and that's fine I'm not against it but it's just not me so anyway winter solstice December 21st 2020 I was facing a whole bunch of dental work and I knew that when it was over I was only going to have eight teeth that's what I have. Six in the front, two on the bottom. That's it. All the rest are out. So, preparing for that, and it was winter solstice. This came to me in the middle of the night. That's what happens a lot of times. But this is it. And it goes like this. <clears throat> I'm a Queer dyke non-binary woman Those are some of the labels I own 
I'm a hip crip with visions who hears voices, and I do. I enjoy being a crone. I've learned to embrace my inner grandma along with my spunky inner child. Now I'm gray and wrinkled and toothless while inside I'm still juicy and wild. I know that my spirit lives forever. I'm glad that we're really not alone. I'm thankful to be here and then hereafter. I enjoy being a crone. I love being in the crone zone. I enjoy being a crone. If you've survived long enough, you, you could like it. You could really could. Oh, the crone zone. I love it. Yeah. Happy crone zone to everybody. Hope you make it. It's a great place to be. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Appreciate all you bring <laughs> musically and uh, humorly. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. You know I need this, right? That's what keeps me going. We need it, too. We need it, too. Um, all right, y'all, we're rounding out on the end of the hour here. Um, and I know there's been a, a link to an evaluation put in the chat. We super appreciate your feedback. It takes just a minute. It keeps us making these better and better. Um, and, you know, as I said at the beginning, D Detroit Disability Power is an organization that's building power and works on policy. So we would be remiss if we did not ask you to take some sort of an action this evening. Um, many of us have municipal elections uh, just a few weeks away, and it's imperative that we show candidates and current elected officials that we disabled people care about voting rights and access. So we are going to put up a link to the pledge, uh, the pledge, the power pledge for disabled um, voters and allies in the chat. Um, that is a pledge that, that you can take to stand up for the rights and access uh, in voting for disabled people and everyone. We're also getting candidates and elected officials to take the pledge so we can then uh, lift that up as an important part of considerations for this year's elections. Uh, and, and, and just a couple more quick notes. Um, if you like these kind of reflective and experiential conversations um, and you wanna do more talking and, and, uh, and not just be in the audience listening and learning, uh, we have community care circles that happen once a month on the third Sunday. Um, we're going to put a link to those in the chat as well. These are a great way for people with a variety of disabilities and or caregivers to uh, come together and really, you know, talk about these things in a real life kind of way. Um, also, if you like this kind of stuff, please join DDP. Um, we are a membership organization and the more members we have, the stronger we can be together. Uh, so please, please join us as a member. We would love to have you. You don't have to live in Detroit. You don't have to live in Michigan. You just have to think disabled people <laughs> deserve better and that we can do that together by building power. So um, thank you for coming, everybody. It's been, it's been really great. I want to, another shout out to our panelists uh, for bringing all the wisdom that they do. Uh, I want to thank the DDP team behind the scenes for making sure the tech, et cetera, is functioning. Um, thank you, Elaine, for singing. And thank you to Matt and Sean, our interpreters tonight. Um, please take care. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.